烧，银铃声，卡埃拉铃，阿萨卡哈拉铃，扎卡拉铃，烧埃铃铃声。Namaste. So, amidst the spiraling confusion about coronavirus, virus, and this and that, I don't know. People get so hung up on these little things, huh? Why? Because the stock market took a hit. Oh my God! What are we going to do? <laughs> See, that's what happens when you have a culture that measures everything in terms of money. If anything goes wrong in the, with the money system, then people are more concerned than the people who are dying because of this disease. It's very bad. You see, I see this whole thing that everybody is so wound up about as just a minor skirmish. In a huge, thousands of years long arc of human history, which is a war against nature. Christian culture denigrates women, sets man above nature. Allows or even encourages animal slaughter and torture. Oh, what to speak of war? Justifying colonialism, wiping out whole races of people like the Native Americans and in other places, just to facilitate colonialism and economic expansion. And now, Mother Nature has had enough. Huh? You know, I'm very much in tune with the mother. I always have been, actually. And back in the 1960s, my first wife was half Native American, and she took me to the reservation. And I met the wise men. I met the elders, and they told me then about global warming. About climate change, and about the eventual defeat of Christian culture by Mother Nature. I mean, do these idiots really think they can win a battle against Mother Nature? You see, they're so brainwashed by this nonsense that somehow God has set them above everything else. That it justifies every kind of cruelty, every kind of sinful, aggressive action, and so on. In other words, they're demons. Okay, let's not pull any punches. the The worldwide culture, the global culture, especially in the last mm, three to five hundred years, has become, for all practical purposes, Christian. Even here in India. People are slaughtering cattle and eating meat, and even Brahmins huh, are eating chicken and not thinking anything of it. See, this is this very degraded condition of society. Now we have a president in the most powerful na nation in the world who likes to boast that he grabs women by the pussy. Well, what kind of idiot is this? How can anybody、uh, back him or support him? A, a man like that? I mean, really. So, mother is saying, "All right, you guys aren't going to police yourselves. You guys aren't going to regulate yourselves. I'm going to have to step in." So she shows up with her millions of lions. <laughs> 
you know, you can't win. You can't win against nature. Huh? You can't beat City Hall, is the American expression. Why? Because they make the laws, they make the rules. You can't beat Mother Nature because she makes the rules. And the rules are, if you irritate nature long enough and persistently enough, she will strike back. So this whole coronavirus nonsense, look at where it's hitting. It's hitting in the, in the northern countries. Huh? It's hitting in the places where people eat meat indiscriminately. Here in South India, there's no worries about it at all because the majority is vegetarian. You see, this is how it goes. This is also, by the way, one of the most seismically stable places in the world. There haven't been any major earthquakes in here in thousands of years. In North India, though, <laughs> it's another story. The Himalayas are a huge fault zone, and there's bound to be a lot of movement along that line. And then there's storms. <laughs> what happens when there's a cyclone? Huh? You know, they, they travel on uh, usually quite predictable paths. Well, every time there's a cyclone and it comes close to hitting India, or it does hit India, it hits in the north. And all it does down here is dumps a, a few extra inches of rain. And so the farmers benefit. They like it a lot. They pray for cyclones. <laughs> we had one hit pretty close to right on when I was living in Mahabalipuram. And, you know, some power lines went down and things were a little, a little sketchy for a few days. That's all. You know? And like I said, India is resilient because the whole manual agriculture system still exists in a dormant state. Yeah, people have tractors and stuff like that, but they also have oxen and horses and wagons to use with them. The old, the old plows are still sitting out in back of most farmers' houses. So even we could lose electricity, we could lose petrol, and it wouldn't really affect us that much. We could recover. But in the northern countries, oh my God. See, and that's what's next. You, you think this coronavirus thing, this is, just a, this is just a little dip, you know? What happens when things really crash? Huh? When the when the oil runs out, or when it becomes so difficult to get out of the ground that nobody can afford it, huh? you're going to get your electric car, and what's that going to run on? You've got to give the power plant something to burn. You know, people just, they miss everything. Okay, now that we're past eight minutes, it means all the idiots have already left, so I can talk about the real subject. <laughs> which is the light. How do we know that we're making tangible spiritual progress? Well, it's very simple. Go in a dark room, sit down, close your eyes, and see how much light you can see within. Now, there are three kinds of light that you see when you close your eyes. One kind is ambient light, like it's a very bright morning, sunlight is coming into the room. If I close my eyes, I see a lot of red ambient light coming through my eyelids. And that's not the light we're talking about. <laughs> or if I go back here in the storage room and close the door and window, it's pretty dark. So if I go in there and sit down and close my eyes, I still see a lot of light. Well, what's that? That's called the after image. The retina of the eye stores light. And after you close your eyes, or if you go in a dark place, this light still remains for some time. 
it's phosphorescent, you know, like those, um, what it, well, it used to be watch, watches. I haven't worn a watch in, I don't know, 30 years. <laughs> but anyway, um, there used to be these watches that absorb light and then you go in a dark place and they glow, you know, for a few minutes. But that's not the kind of light we're talking about either. So you go in a dark place, sit down, close your eyes, and wait for about five minutes. Concentrate your mind. You should start seeing another kind of light. This third kind of light is, is like little sparks little pips huh, of different colors, white, blue, or red, in my experience. And I don't know what the proper name for, for this is. A friend of mine calls them stars. <laughs> but they're just momentary, little flashes. And you'll often find that they uh, coincide with certain types of thoughts. When you have an insightful thought or a, a correct thought or a thought that's pleasing to the devas who are always hovering around, you'll get a flash. And especially a blue flash is very good. Huh? So if you're able to concentrate, I remember <laughs> when I first started to try to meditate, Way back when I was about, I don't know, 20, 21 years old, I didn't see anything, just black. And if this happens to you, I can tell you what it's about. It's because you've been eating meat. Meat eating clogs up the finer passages of the brain and the nervous system. One becomes desensitized because of all the fear poisons in the meat. When the animal is killed, it, its uh, glands, endocrine glands, are dumping adrenaline and, and similar chemicals into the bloodstream, and that remains in the meat. And when you eat it, then you get an, an adrenaline high, huh? which is like testosterone. You know those wrestlers who take a lot of testosterone to get big, and they're like, oh, he's angry. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm going to get this guy, and I'm going to throw him right out of the ring. Yeah, just you watch. Nah. That's because of testosterone. Testosterone is very close, chemically, to adrenaline. Adrenaline is like speed. It gives you this false feeling of, uh, you know, I can do anything. I'm invulnerable. Huh? So, <laughs> people are high on adrenaline. Or they were addicted, actually, to adrenaline because of eating meat. And if they stop, they get withdrawal symptoms. I stopped eating meat when I was 16. But by the time I was 21, 22, I still only saw black when I went to meditate. It took uh, Charan Singh. Charan Singh gave me initiation into the inner light and sound meditation when I was, I don't know, 30, 31 years old, and that, that turned everything on again. <laughs> so it's not easy, once you become contaminated, to make contact with the inner light and sound. But now, I mean, this last weekend, with the full moon and all, I took the opportunity to go back into deep meditation and, you know, just to see where I'm at, right? And man, there was so much light, <laughs> light coming from every direction and surrounding me and uh, fountains of light and, I mean, light everywhere. Uh, that's how you know you're making advancement. That's how you know you're on the right track. The little sparkles, the little stars huh, flickering in the beginning, gradually turn into a more steady light. It's still kind of sparkly looking. It's a different quality of light from either the ambient light that comes through your eyelids or the uh, phosphorescence uh, that remains after 
you expose your eyes to light for some time. That's kind of a steady, dull glow. Whereas this meditational light is kind of sparkly. You know, it's, it's hard to describe, really. I haven't seen any visuals that really capture it, you know. And it's always changing. So finally, what is this light? Uh, where does it come from? What is it? Well, we have Shiva, who's the Prakasha, the directly visible. Uh, he's the source of light. And then there's Shakti, who's the Vimarsha, which means the reflection. So, because actually we are Brahman, we are Shiva, we are the source of light that illuminates everything that we're conscious of. And when this light is reflected by Shakti, we, then we can see it. Otherwise, we can't see it. We can only see it if we're illuminating different objects to be conscious of, or if we're in meditation and Shakti wants to encourage us by giving us, you know, some feedback, some light. So I've always said that the light that we see in meditation is the reflection of the Atma in the purified mind. But now we know more about the purified mind. It's actually Shakti. So Shakti is directly giving feedback to you in meditation. So if you meditate and you're seeing a lot of light, follow that. Anything that you do that increases it, take it as guidance. Huh? This is what you should do more of. And of course, you'll find the main thing is to get rid of the coverings, get rid of the upadis that block the light. And the upadi, the main upadi is the ego, the sense of I am an individual. I am my body. This is mine. This is me. Huh? This is I. So if you can set that aside during meditation, you'll get more and more light. That's the process. It's a subtractive process that leads to enlightenment huh? by removing the coverings of upadi. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.